A massive thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Recently, in anticipation of the now imminent release of its sequel, I decided to revisit The Last of Us. All told, it was a surprisingly uneasy experience, and not just because of, you know, everything going on in the world today. This was a game that, despite not having played it in full for many, many years, I still held extremely fond memories of, forming part of that 2013 trifecta alongside Bioshock Infinite and GTA V. A blowout for the previous generation, with these ridiculously high budget quote unquote cinematic games that pushed the hardware to its absolute limits. These felt like games that, due to their high production values, you could see legitimising the medium somewhat. The kinds of titles you could point to and tell the naysayers that, look, games look like this now, they're saying something now. And what worried me about revisiting The Last of Us was that, well, that perspective seems comically naive in retrospect. Infinite's gunplay is at odds with its story, and GTA V, well, imagine Heat if Wayne Grow was the protagonist. You know, these games just don't hold up like I remember, and I was extremely worried the same would occur with The Last of Us. It and the discussions surrounding it were a huge part of what encouraged me to start writing about games in the first place. The Last of Us meant a lot to me. And indeed, there are ways in which it shows its age, its attempts to create a more naturalistic, grounded experience, but up against some odd technical issues here and there. But for whatever flaws it might have, there's a part of The Last of Us where, for me, all of that fades away, where it gleefully ascends above the other big titles of that year, where I'm reminded of everything I loved about the game both then and now. It's the ending, or specifically the last three lines, where after Joel's brutal rampage through the hospital to rescue Ellie, she demands demands that he promise her that everything he said about what went down was true. He replies, I swear. She responds, okay, cut to black. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've thought about this ending probably more than any other in a video game. For a couple of years post-release, it would pop into my head on a daily basis and it still floors me just as hard now. And when I think about why, I keep coming back to those pauses, so pregnant as they are with meaning and unbearable tension, taking such a seemingly simple exchange and complicating it with the vast wealth of reasons the characters got to this point, and full of the things they desperately want to say to each other but can't. It's Joel knowing his facade has finally reached its breaking point and Ellie knowing there's nothing she can do about it. And these three lines carry all of this meaning because rather than heavy-handed exposition telling us exactly how these characters feel, all of this is inferred through the slightest of details. We don't know how much time has passed since Ellie woke up on the back seat, how long her suspicion towards Joel has been stewing, nothing, in a way shockingly dissimilar to a lot of games of the time that needed to spend so long explaining their outlandish concepts to you, the beauty of the ending here is the stark absence of words. It is so soul-destroying precisely because the game trusts the player enough to stumble across these horrible layers of meaning themselves. See, this could have been a case of Joel rescuing Ellie, lying to her about what happened, and that would have been gut-wrenching enough. For sure, Joel not only doomed humanity by destroying any chance of a vaccine, but did so in a particularly ferocious way. You don't need me to tell you how bad this is, but you can perhaps also see where he's coming from. Ellie at this point is more than a friend, more than a travel buddy. After hours and hours of playtime in which Joel tries his hardest to reject the notion, Ellie finally becomes a vector through which he is forced to confront and mourn the loss of his actual daughter. This is by far the deepest connection he's formed in 20 years, where every small bit of joy has simultaneously been ripped away from him. The idea that this too would be taken and so unceremoniously to boot without so much as a goodbye, after both he and Ellie fought so goddamn hard to get there? Don't get me wrong, Joel did a really, truly monstrous thing. Well, several monstrous things, actually. And I'm not here to tell you that he's somehow the good guy. But at the very least, I can trace the through line that got him to that point. These are the despicable actions of a desperate, desperate man. And as a player, you're wrestling with this understanding of the seemingly endless torture that Joel has endured and why he did what he did against the utter monstrosity of what he did. The game suddenly cuts away before giving you any kind of resolution. Already, we're at a point of unsettling ambiguity. This would be enough for most games, but not the last of us. The writers here managed to take this already devastating ending and propel its tension even further. Those three lines that hit so hard only get to 
to happen because the team decides to insert the tiniest of details moments before. That slightly confused look in Ellie's eyes when she wakes up in the back of the car, shocked that she even opened them again to begin with. There are no extra words spoken here, and suddenly all these additionally torturous layers now compound an already shocking twist. See, her despondence upon waking up wasn't simply some post-anesthesia grogginess. She knew. She goddamn knew she was sacrificing her life for what she saw to be the greater good. We can even infer from her speech about Riley that this was her choice to overcome her survivor's guilt. And Joel not only took that from her, but had the gall to look her in the eye and lie about it. With one look on top of all the thoughts the player might already have about Joel, both the player and Ellie now need to rethink their entire relationship with the only person she could trust, the one that we've just spent 15 hours of game time building this relationship with. One detail, three lines, that's all the game needs to get all of this. Even talking about it now just destroys me, it's so good all these years later. And what's more, this is just one of several similar occurrences where the most subtle of details tell the game's story in a remarkably restrained way. You don't need to be told Joel is thinking of Sarah when discussing the need to survive during the final scene. He'll just lightly graze the watch she got him, the one he's still wearing all these years later for just a few harrowing frames. There's no big speech where Joel reveals to Ellie that he's finally ready to open up to her after so long of repressing the pain and trauma of losing his daughter. All he needs to do is call her baby girl and you'll figure out the rest. This is detail-oriented storytelling at a level that few AAA games have managed to achieve before or since, either laying it on too thick with the exposition or just saying the same thing over and over again. And all of this has gotten me thinking a lot about the upcoming sequel, because honestly, I'm not even sure I want to sequel at this stage. That ending is so perfect, left so much for the player to interpret themselves, that the announcement trailer had me more trepidatious than excited. But I don't know, after playing through the original again and being surprised at just how well this form of storytelling holds up, I just hope the team at Naughty Dog, beyond, you know, not crunching their employees to death, place that same trust in the player to have them figure out the finer points of what's going on. Because beyond massive budgets or big flashy production values shared with its contemporaries, the way this game really stands the test of time is in its unique ability to communicate so much with three lines and a wayward glance. And speaking of lines, I'd like to now say a few lines about today's sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people, where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's inspiring online classes on topics including illustration, photography, video, design, and more. If the kind of detail-oriented storytelling I talked about in the video interests you, maybe try a class like writing character-driven short stories with Yoon Lee. Writing short stories, you're having to convey a lot of information about your scenario and your characters in a limited space. This class gives you practical advice on how to be as economic and evocative with your language as possible. What's more, Skillshare offers classes designed for real life and all the circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay inspired, express yourself, and introduce you to a community of millions, all for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. And because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, the first thousand people who click my link in the description can get a two-month free trial of premium membership, so there's no risk to checking it out for yourself, and you'll really be helping the channel in the process. Thank you to Skillshare share for sponsoring this video, and I hope you all enjoyed this piece about The Last of Us. I'd like to sincerely thank my patrons here. Your continued support during this weird time is absolutely the thing that allows me to keep making videos, and I can never thank you enough for that. If you feel like you can, and only if you feel like you can, you can really help the channel continue, as well as get things like early access to ad-free video uploads by heading to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledging only what you feel comfortable with. I am immensely grateful for your support in whatever form it takes. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsyuk, Ruth Knapman, Leah Cinello, Konstantino Zakinis, Henry Milek, Edward Clayton Andrews, Hebe Amori, Bryce Snyder, Rob, Tommy Carver Chaplin, David Bjork, Lucas, Dallas Keen, William Fielder, my dad, Timothy Jones, The Nameless Guy, Ham Begus, Samuel Pickens, Shardfire, Anna Pimentel, Justin Solderness, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you so much for watching, stay safe, and I will see you all next time.